Hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Happy second day after Thanksgiving. It's great to see you here. Thank you for joining my live today. I'm going to be taking questions for an hour. And um, uh, Rob is moderating today. He'll be gathering up questions from the chat. That's where you can place your question for me. And we'll take questions that are a good fit for things that I talk about. And uh, we will stay away from anything that's explicit, um, you know, uh, nasty, that kind of thing. But I, if you have a question about a challenge that you're having as a person with trauma, I'm your gal. <laughs> Go ahead and ask the question. Also, feel free to chat with each other. This is such a place where people make friends. And um, just keep in mind um, here, we don't talk about politics. We don't go into depth about trauma. We prefer you not talk about what happened to you. Talk about instead where you're going with your healing. What are the tools you're using today? How's it working for you? Have you had any wins this week? Um, for Thanksgiving, you know, it's really easy. There's a lot of forums where people go, oh, they're so terrible, the family. But actually, that kind of brings you down when you talk about it, brings other people down to hear about it. Talk about, like, what was your win? What are you doing today? to sort of get back into self-regulation and having a good outlook on your life. One thing I'm doing is I'm taking lots of long walks and um, the extra sort of holiday time gives me more time to do that. And I'm, it works so well because just the fact of holidays, there's just, I don't know, and the winter, the darkness, the eating too much, all that stuff can be kind of triggery. So I just go right into a positive action of something that is, um, helps me re-regulate. Ah, so uh, let's see, no politics. Please don't give unsolicited advice. Don't tell other people what they need to do or what they need to read or that they ought to go to therapy. Everybody here is going to figure out what they need to do. But if you feel like sharing something that you did that's really helpful, that's just fine. You can do that. Um, let's see. Uh, no advice. Uh, if you're religious, same thing. It's okay if you want to self-identify as your uh, religion or lack thereof, but don't tell other people what they need to do or believe. And that's how we keep it like a really easygoing space for people to talk about their healing process. Focus on the healing. Okay, here we go. Um, oh, by the way, the one thing, I'm going to say it now, I'm going to say it soon again, but we're having our Black Friday sale. You may already know that. If you're on our mail list, you've gotten messages about it. But the, all the courses and the membership, the annual membership, are 30% off right now. And um, Rob, could you throw the link in there to the um, Black Friday sale? So you can go there while we're chatting. You can go pick up a membership or take a course. And um, we would love to have you here. What I'm going to be teaching you today is about principles you can use with the problems that you're having around your trauma, tools you can use. And then I'm always going to encourage you to have community around healing. If you have people who get it, who are walking the path with you, it will so amplify your efforts to heal. Many of us have tried to heal, like maybe living in the family of origin house and um, or hanging out with old friends who are still very much stuck in the trauma. And you kind of know how that pulls you down. It's so good to walk the path with people who are working on the solution with you. So our membership it, uh, you get all the courses, you get access to my monthly webinars for free, you get to come to member group coaching, coaching twice a month. You can come, no matter whether you're a member paid or anything, I have free daily practice calls twice a month as well. Everybody can come to those. But um, there's a Facebook group too. It's a secret Facebook group for members and it's a really great community where they're doing the daily practice and people are supporting each other. It's very well moderated and great people there who are experienced using the techniques and principles of crappy childhood fairy. All right. So that's my little spiel. I'll mention that again later, but uh, definitely Rob, if you would just periodically throw that link up there to make sure people just joining the call know this is the cheapest it's going to be. <laughs> this is, this is our lowest price ever. And I know that this sounds like a, like an ad, isn't it? But it is, you should come, come be with us. Come do this thing. If you like my videos, come, come do it. All right. So, Oh yeah, and if you're one, if you can't find the link in the chat, we all there's also a link in the description. Um, and so, as you're watching this, you have access to the description section, and there's links there <clears throat> to the sale, the daily practice course. I have a webinar coming up. The next one is on December 12th, and it is about becoming your real self. 
<clears throat> and, um, and then we also have eight week coaching intensive every month and the next one's December 30th. So Rob will put links there and you'll find them also in the description section. All right. So my first question is from PD28. I'm seeing a man who lives with a girlfriend. We are so much alike. We have a lot in common. He says they don't sleep in the same bed. Yes, I had sex. My husband died years ago. He says I can't hurt or leave her. Um, so I guess the boyfriend says, or he says he, he doesn't want to hurt or leave her. Okay, so you're having an affair um, and you're lying to somebody about it. And if you watch my videos, I bet you know exactly what I'm going to say. I'm just going to say, look, if you want to, if you want to have real love and you want to recover, A, you have to stop destroying other people. You got to stop. It's even if all you believe in is karma, then, you know, you, you're never going to have a good relationship when you operate by hurting other people and sort of stealing their peace and serenity from them. One day she's going to find out and it's going to be terrible. It's going to be damaging. And if you want to have a relationship um, with a healthy person who loves you, who's available, who's not living with somebody else, you've got to clear up <clears throat> your energy, you have to clear up your, you have to get that cab light on. And you do that by, first of all, you have to get out of like terrible, destructive, immoral behavior. So if you're stealing, lying, all that stuff, no healthy person wants to be with somebody who does that. And even if you lie to them and hide it from them, they can feel it. A healthy person is tuned in and someone who loves you, you want somebody who senses you and goes, Hey, is something wrong? Is, uh, you know, are you, is something bothering you? That's what a healthy person does. And when you approach a healthy person thinking, Oh, I can just have this like immoral, hurtful, damaging thing that hurts my spirit and hurts my integrity. And then a nice person will come along and snap, you know, that will all work out. That doesn't work out. I think everyone's in a blue, in a century, there's one highly publicized relationship where it seemed to work out, but there's, you know, you, you don't want to be haunted by shame and destruction in, in your relationship. To really have a relationship go the distance, you need this resiliency. You need this well that's basically good. There's no lies in it. There's no shame in it. There's no, um, no, no hurting other people in it. In fact, a good relationship is very much oriented towards contributing something positive to the world and supporting other people. So I would just say, you know, like today, get out of that relationship. It's wrong. If, if it's not something, you know, I know there are people who are polyamorous. That's not what this is because she's being lied to. He can't hurt her and he's not available. And, you know, the, I, if I had a nickel for every letter I get from somebody who says, I'm seeing somebody who lives with their ex and, uh, but they're, you know, they don't love them anymore and they don't blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, it's, you're not alone and don't be fooled by it. It's crap fit. If anybody hasn't heard my word crap fit before, it's where we fit ourselves to unacceptable situations and people. And it's just unacceptable to be with somebody who isn't going to leave their partner for you um, and would even have to leave their partner for you. You want to find somebody who's ready to go, has their light shining, they're ready, their life is clear, there's no X's all entangled in there, there's no complications, you know, there's like love is possible, real love is possible. And um, I know the thinking where it's like, oh, well, you know, I just, I, I have to get my needs met while I wait for the real thing to come along. But uh, again, that's like, mm, that's not how it works. You damage your light, your light goes off. You get this weird aura of lack of integrity and you stop being able to even spot the good people. I mean, so many people who come to my channel, they cannot recognize a good person or they don't feel attraction to a good person. And that lack of attraction to healthy people, that's what it is. Your spirit is all complicated with all this dishonesty and shame and stuff. And that needs to be cleared up. You can clear it up. You can, you can stop the lies. You can apologize where it's appropriate, which it isn't when somebody doesn't know you've been having an affair with their partner. You, the, the, the apology is to get away and stop having contact. That's how you make up for that. And then um, you start to take really good care of yourself and treat other people with respect in the same way you treat yourself with, with respect and things will start to clear up for you. All right. I hope that helps. All right, Jessica, uh, do people with CPTSD struggle with physical intimacy? Sure. Um, first of all, a lot of people do and CPTSD people, there's often, you know, sexual abuse there and attachment wounds that make it, um, kind of like a, 
what's the word I'm looking for? A little car that goes around too fast and then goes so too slow and then just drives over the table ledge and you know, <laughs> it goes all over the place. So part of your trauma healing is what's go your trauma healing is what's going to make it possible for you to be in touch with yourself. We say intimacy as a euphemism for sex, but intimacy being being close to another person in communication with them, not just having hookups. That takes that takes healing. That takes healing. And so never fear because I the people used to always say you need to, you know, you need to change who you are and fundamentally love yourself before you can have all the love have nice things in life. And that used to be so discouraging to me because it's like, excuse me, but how would I do that? They're like, oh, you just need to find a good therapist. And it's like, and who would that be? And how would I pay for it? And I, I'm not somebody who benefited from therapy. I went many, many times. And I know some people do. There are good ones. And some of them actually know about trauma, but there's a, it's very difficult to find out who they are. There's no list that tells you for real, like who those people are. So you have to go on your own quest if therapy is your thing, whether therapy is your thing or not. I have tools here that you can use every day. And that's, I really believe like complex PTSD, it can't wait for a weekly appointment. It needs to be handled every day, you know, probably several times a day when it comes up, when your dysregulation hits, it's like, whew, you need tools you can use right away. You need friends you can reach out to right then when you need some help, like not calling the guy or not blowing, losing your temper at the kid or, or not walking out on the job and all those destructive decisions that we make. And um, so friends and tools and therapy, if you like, if you, if you can, I think, you know, only a minority of people can even afford therapy and only a more minority of those are lucky enough to find trauma therapy that actually works for them. So, so I really encourage you to use some tools. All right. Um, Judy Crowell says, I had a bad surprise from my son and now I have trust issues with him. Um, he's the only family I have left. I need to mend the relationship. I don't know how. Okay, Judy, I'll come back to your question if you want to tell me something, but that there's no information there, um, on what the problem is and mending a relationship if you actually hurt him. Okay. Um, any advice for limerent thinking about a failed friendship from childhood? Asked Keeping Cool with Callie. I think about her every day and she broke up with me as a friend nearly four years ago. Oh, well, uh, limerence. So if somebody doesn't want to be your friend, the right thing to do is if you, I, I assume you've tried to talk to her about it and amend the relationship and see if there was something that you needed to do to make it better for her. But assuming it's over, um, then it's healthy to clear that away from your life and heal up the memory that's sitting there activated and electrified that you keep thinking about it, which sounds like a, you know, it's a trauma thing. And so any form of limerence, like, you know, can't stop thinking about some fantasy relationship that's not really available in real life. Limerence hits you when you have no joy in your life. And the best solution for limerence is to start filling your life with things you enjoy and things that feel meaningful to you. And limerence will really get you. Um, it got people so bad during the lockdown because it was a relatively joyless time. There was very little connection. So getting outside, getting exercise, connecting with people, both friends and um, strangers. When you go buy your groceries, go have a chat with the cashier, you know, say something friendly to them, start connecting up. It's so powerful. Your connection with the world through other people is uh, so many people with trauma, like they can't deal with it. It's triggering. This is where, okay, I just want to put in a plug, my connection boot camp. This is a 30 day course to help anybody who is on this call and you find it hard to talk to people and you're basically handling how triggery it is for you to deal with people by avoiding people. A few people will say, I like avoiding people. I want to be alone forever. Just me and my dog. Okay. Um, but I assume if you're on this call, you're trying to have something a little more than that. And if you want to do that, there's a path. It's a 30 day thing where I explain um, about all the things that get in the way. If you're really going to connect with people, and have real connections. And real connections are what pushes the limerence away. Like as kids, we couldn't have that real connection with parents perhaps. So we had to dream it up. We, we imagined, we got very good at imagining like a deep, meaningful relationship. And the irony of still doing that as adults is it guarantees we will not have deep, meaningful relationships. 
And so there's often this little high of a little fantasy relationship for a minute. You get, you know, get thrown a bone or something. Somebody texts you or you get hope or you have a happy dream or something about it. And then comes the depression because it's not here. And the depression is bitter and it's cruel. And I wish that on no one. And that's a terrible way to head into the holidays too, is pining away for somebody who is not, does not want to be in your life. So rather than just trying to punish yourself, I do believe that you should try to take your mind off things. Um, I feel like that's not emphasized enough in a lot of approaches to healing. Like we don't have 100% control over our thoughts and emotions, but we have 20 or 40% and we got to employ that. So when you catch yourself thinking about the person, just remember, oh yeah, I'm, I'm working on a plan to stop thinking about that person. Definitely stop talking about the person. There is nothing that you need to say about that person anymore. And limerent people will often want to go on and on and on about this person who's not into them and go, well, one time and they blah, blah, blah. But the thing that was so great and talking about it is a way to try to tap back into that weird like dopamine drug of the fantasy, talking about it. And so some of us have had friends who do that. They want to keep telling us about somebody that they are limerent on. And they're basically just trying to squeeze dopamine for themselves out of us standing there like a doll, you know, like a robot for them. And that's why it feels draining and weird when people do that. So you really just, you, you got to discipline yourself. Like, don't talk about it. There's nothing that needs to be said. It's not interesting to other people. It's not therapeutic. You've talked about it before. You know about it. What I teach here is to use the daily practice. And a lot of you here know about it. You use it. The daily practice is two techniques done together, writing fears and resentments in a very spe specific format. Rob, could you put the link to the daily practice in there? If you haven't taken it, if you like my videos, this is a free course. You can learn and try the techniques in less than an hour. And there's more videos with FAQs to teach you in more detail how to do that. So, so you, um, you can get all those obsessive thoughts about somebody you miss into your daily practice. You write it, you ask for it to be removed, you meditate, don't follow my verbal instructions. You will need the course. I want to emphasize that. If you just follow my verbal instructions and kind of do it, there's a high probability it would just make you feel worse. There's a very specific technique to this so that it makes you feel set free for a while. You get set free for a while, but your our obsessions, our negative thoughts, they always come back. So don't worry about that. We, we need a little free time. If you get an hour, a few hours of lightness, uh, lightheartedness around stuff that was getting you down, you can, you know, a lot of uh, change and evolution in yourself can come in that little window of time. So you really want to pursue that a little free time. So the daily practice is done twice a day. It's very powerful. In February, it will have been 30 years that I, since I started doing it. And I cannot tell you how profoundly it affected my life. I mean, very quickly it changed things for me and it continues to change things for me. And it set me free to become who I really am. Hey, Rob, can you come get the cat? She's banging around here. <laughs> I knew that would happen. She wants to hang out with me, but she's she's like, I want to open the closet door. Kitty. Hold on. Let's get her to say hi. Come here and say hi. Open it for you. There you go. <laughs> there she is. See? See, Kitty? See how beautiful you are? <laughs> there you go. There's Rob. He came, came together. <laughs> Sometimes this happens. So with limerence, you really want joy and you want stuff that's re-regulating because um, limerence is a little bit genetic. It's a little bit from dysregulation. It comes with depression. It comes with loneliness and it comes with joylessness and it comes with meaninglessness. And I believe strongly we really, really, really need meaning in our lives. And Meaning is not abstract. Meaning generally will come from figuring out what it is your unique gift is to be bringing into the world. Everybody has something they need to be doing and it feels yucky and empty until you find it. I used to lay awake nights. I, um, what I do on crappy childhood fairy, sort of an evolution out of what I used to do as a, I was a sponsor in Al-Anon for a lot of women and it, you know, it went moderately well. It was pretty good. Um, but I would lay awake nights going, I don't think this is it. There's more. There's. I'm supposed to be doing something else. There needs to be a book. Well, now there is a book. It's coming out in October 2024 from Hay House. And I, I knew that I needed to, I could see myself kind of speaking in front of a lot of people. Zoom wasn't invented yet. But, 
but I felt I could feel it coming and um, it would keep me awake nights. And I remember with my husband, we were taking a hike. Gosh, it was at least 10 years ago. I started Crappy Childhood Fairy as a little blog seven years ago. And we were, we were taking a little walk and I, I was in tears and I said, I don't know how to explain this to you, but I, there's this thing I have to do and I don't even know what it is. And it means I'm going to have to work a little less because <laughs> I need to make room in my life to do this. And I think I need to spend some money to learn some skills. I need, you know, I, I went and took a seminar. So those are some of the things that have straightened out a lot of my, um, you know, I just call it disordered thinking. Limerence is one form of disordered thinking that's gradually healed for me, but also just kind of like negative rumination or productivity crashing where we, uh, do you get that? Where you do a big accomplishment and then it just like throws you down for a few days or a few months and you can't continue. And, uh, and then you think, oh, that's it. I tried and failed. But a lot of that stuff is normal for PTSD people. So when we're in community and we have something like that, our productivity crashes, or we get spun out over somebody who's not interested in us, or we lose a job, or one of those big trigger events happens, we have our community and go, oh, well, this thing happened, and we lift each other up. We're like, we've got you. Have you done your daily practice? In the membership program, we have um, peer-led daily practice calls multiple times every day. And I don't know if you've, many of you have come to my calls. We have a we had a few hundred people on there the other day. It was fantastic. And we do the techniques together and I take questions and the call went on for over two hours. Really like a great joy, totally feeling like this is the meaningful, the most meaningful thing ever in my life is being on those calls. And a lot of people who have learned the daily practice organize these calls together through our membership. So um, Rob, would you mind throwing up the 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 link for the it's a Black Friday sale right now, and boy, is it popular. People are jumping into the membership, and we just started it Wednesday. It's going to go through tomorrow. If you sign up right now, you can dive in and start taking courses. You can ask to come into the Facebook group and um, start start participating right away. We have really strong guidelines. If you're nervous about Facebook, we take we we we're, it's very moderated. We have similar rules there that we have here where we don't talk about politics. We don't give direct advice. Um, and we have, we ask that people very lightly talk about, um, whatever happened to them. It's not a place where you come in and tell all your horror stories. It's a place where you come in and start working the crappy childhood fairy program with the support of friends. And it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's, and it, it's interesting because when we started it, I just thought, I just don't even know, how am I going to make this a good experience for people? But you know what? The members make it a good experience for people. There's just a really positive spirit there. So uh, you're invited to join that. You can also, there's a monthly, um, if you don't have a ton of money, you can pay for it monthly and uh, for $59 a month US. And that option is there. But right now with the Black Friday sale, you can get the whole year for 347 bucks, I think. And that's as cheap as it goes. And it's I, I think it's a fantastic deal. <laughs> if anybody's a member of you here, you can you can chime in. All right. Um, that was a fruitful question. Thank you for that. Go get some meaning, get some um, some friendship and some tools and get your life moving and it will tend to push away. It's kind of like vitamin C for colds is is uh, joy and meaning in your life to get to guard against limerence. Look at my eyes are all puffy. You know why? from eating all that crud over the weekend. <laughs> we had Thanksgiving and then it was my husband's birthday. So it was like, woo. <laughs> Today, not so much. Today I'm eating clean and on the wagon. Very happy about that. All right. Another question. Um, Z says, how do you move on from heavy grief that doesn't go away, that has so many layers? I think the stress I've had for 15 years has caused autoimmune illnesses to pop up. I'm so tired. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a couple autoimmune stuff. I have Graves disease and I have vitiligo and neither of them give me any trouble and anymore. But I know that as a person with trauma, I have to sort of be vigilant about that. If I let myself get super stressed out and same for all of you, we can be really vulnerable to autoimmune disease. 
And a little, there is something known about that, you know, now why that is, why they're so close. They're very closely correlated. The more trauma you have, the more risk you have. Doesn't mean a guarantee that you're going to have them, but the risk goes up. And we can reduce our risk by taking care of ourselves physically with exercise and good food, sleep, the usual suspects, but also keeping stress down. So what is stress? People all say that like, oh, you shouldn't be so stressed. But that's another thing. You need a good therapist. You shouldn't be stressed. That was like psychobabble for me because normal people's solutions did not help me with stress. Normal people's solutions didn't help me with depression. And what helped me was naming my fearful and resentful thoughts on paper and, and then at the end of it, asking for it to be removed and then resting my mind in meditation. It's a super powerful combo. Some of you may have seen Andrew Huberman, who's a very popular podcaster in neuroscience. Um, he just did an episode last week about writing to relieve depression and trauma. And I've known about, he just found out about this study. The research happened in the 80s at the University of Texas in Austin. You can learn more about it in my Healing Childhood PTSD course. And uh, a guy named James Pennebaker um, did a lot of research there. There have been 200 uh, um, clinically evaluated, peer-reviewed studies um, on the efficacy of this, but they did a technique that I, I think would be a little harsh for traumatized people, frankly, but it's it was very effective for their average population who participated in the research. And they would think about the worst thing that ever happened to them and write about it for half an hour, four days in a row. And then they would tend to feel exhausted and emotionally wrung out, which sounds familiar for anybody who does the daily practice. We don't do it like that. We don't go straight for the worst thing that ever happened. We write about whatever's bothering us at the moment, you know, when we're writing um, things from the past, worries about the future. We're, you know, all of our thoughts are time traveling, but just like right now, where are you time traveling? What's the problem? rather than trying to go dwell on the worst thing that ever happened. If you do the daily practice a couple times a day, you will get to it. So you had asked about grief, G. And that is, um, grief is natural and normal, but if you're getting stuck on it, it's a form of emotional dysregulation. And something in you is not able to kind of process the grief. So the healthy thing is to be very, very sad about sad things. And everybody on this call has had a, a lot to be sad about. We didn't get trauma by happy things. I'll tell you that. And um, I've had a lot too. I've had so many people die and losses and uh, lost love, lost money, failures, that sort of thing. A lot of grief. And I'm not in grief now. And every once in a while, an old sadness will flip through and just kind of pass me by because it's processed. And by processing, I don't mean talking about it. I mean like your nervous system can move it from the active area. There's like an area where you're dealing with present time. And then there's memories. <laughs> if I can simplify it, there's now and there's memory. And when you have CPTSD, what's impaired is your ability to move stuff from now to memory. And that's why we get these looping thoughts and these stress responses to things. There is a lot piled up there. And so intense sadness is both a natural and normal and appropriate emotion and a stress response if you cannot process it. And I think like some of the major... Um, religions of the world have, let's say, a one-year period you're supposed to wear black or mourn or something. And that's sort of what they recognize as a, a healthy amount of time to be preoccupied with the loss of a loved one that was close to you. And then you should begin to move on. And we never forget them, of course, but there's, you know, processing. It, it, it moves down. I call it an assembly line. But the same thing for things that have made us angry or for things that are, um, that we felt ashamed, like, with CPTSD, it, it's literally like a um, drain clog. You just can't, it gets clogged up in there. There's a lot of stuff going on in your head and you need a way to process. So this writing technique, um, there's the Pennebaker way, which I think is a bit much, a bit, a bit of a downer. We do this every day for all of our lives, twice a day. And he's, they, Pennebaker noticed, oh, that people are exhausted. You're going to have to take time off from work or something. We're like, no, we use meditation. We use a restful form of meditation so that we can handle and sustain and basically recover from the workout, the brain workout of just facing and writing down what's bothering us. So it's a really strong technique. Um, if you like my videos, I really urge you to give it a try. It's different than anything you've ever done before. And it's not a journal. It's not, um, and we're not there to, you know, 
list, go in and make all the, a list of all the bad things that ever happened. It's uh, just moving on whatever is active in our memory, disturbing us and naming it, writing it, asking for it to be removed, resting in meditation. So simple, right? Um, so with grief, with grief, you would phrase it in the daily practice. And I don't know if you're a daily practice person, but you would phrase it as, I have fear that I'm so sad about da 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 or fear mom isn't here anymore. Fear I never said I love you. Fear she never told me. Whatever it is, we call it a fear. So if we have a, any feeling that things are not as they should be, that's we call that fear. Any, and it's it, sometimes it's literal fear, but mostly it's just things. I have fear. I have anxiety. I have I just things are not as they should be. I have fear. I don't look good today. Fear my eyes are puffy. Fear it's because of what I ate. Those are that's the sort of thing that we would get on paper. The other thing we get down is resentment, and fear and anxiety and anger. Fear and resentment. Other word is anxiety and anger. We know anxiety and anger can cause chronic pain. We know they can cause um, ulcers. They can, and they have, they play a huge role in exacerbating autoimmune disease back to the previous, previous thing we discussed with autoimmune disease. So grief just needs to be processed. I think grief is overemphasized. People who don't have PTSD say, you just need to grieve. I've had people tell me that. And I was just like, you're effing so wrong about that. I've spent so much of my life crying every day. I don't need to grieve. That's not the problem. I need to process the grief that I have. Not all of us have blocked access to our emotions. And not all of us should just go in and try to have lots of emotions as a solution. If you are writing the fearful and resentful thoughts that are bothering you each day a couple of times, you can gently take off a coat of paint, a coat of paint, a top layer of what it is that's bothering you, not like diving in with a big tractor to dig up graves. We're not trying to do that. That's too much for PTSD. It'll knock you right into dysregulation, and then you can't continue. You'd be sad and depressed. When you're processing sad things, you know, writing them down and crying. It's so normal to cry when you're writing the daily practice, but there's different flavors of crying out there. There's like bitter, terrible tears of hopelessness. But when you're writing and when you've had the experience of getting a little bit of relief after writing, crying can just be good and cleansing. It can be a very nice feeling actually, just a release. Crying is a release. Crying resets things inside your mind. Crying gives you the happy hormones. Crying is your body taking care of you to process emotions. But I have had the kind of crying that's not that. It's more just like just like an implosion um, that's negative and against oneself. So with the daily practice, we can start shifting those implosions into just release, release, release. <sighs> and with a little release, we have space to have a new experience and space to have some perception. Maybe see some red flags next time. Maybe feel empowered inside to say what you really mean. Say no when you mean yes. Say yes when you mean no. You know, you, you want to stop doing that. <sighs> Getting honest, becoming your real self, having insight, um, having an instinct for when you need to throw up a boundary and an instinct for when you need to chill out and just be kind of go with the flow. That takes a lot of intuition that is totally blocked when all of this is jammed up with fear and resentment. So. But it's not, it's not a bad thing to be sad. It's a bad thing to be sad for too long. That's all. All right. Um, the next question here, Kathy75. How do I overcome this love relationship interdiction spell? Sorry, I don't know what interdiction is. Um, that it's stubborn, not good enough belief about myself. I'm sorry, I need a little more flesh on that question to understand the question. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, how do you find healthy people? You have to be a healthy person. You have to be a healthy person. And I would definitely suggest don't drink alcohol. Don't hang out with, in places of drunkenness. That's a good start. <laughs> learn to be honest, learn to express yourself, get very clear what you're looking for in friends or partners. Um, if you're, th if you're talking about dating, my dating course, the whole beginning of my dating course is where you get very clear about what it is you want for your life and what you want in a partner. I've, I've so far never met a person with CPTSD who had a totally clear picture of that. They've had to like compromise it and narrow it down and 
be, be afraid to really want what they want. And so I get this very muddled thing. I'm going, well, what's your, what do you really want in a relationship? And I always hear, um, kind of like a good communication partnership. And I'm like, so a good communicate, like a business or like, uh, a friend or like, you know, like romantic. I'm like, so a romance that lasts a short time or that like, well, you know, a life partner. So not committed for life, not sharing money. And when it comes right down to it, most people would like like a permanent marriage, <laughs> but it feels so out of reach that we sort of dress up our desires as like something much less than that. And if you, if you only want something less than that, chances are the best you're going to get is something less than that. So it's really important to just go ahead and name what it is you want. So while you're working on becoming a healthy person, you are getting very clear about what it is that you want to be as a person and what you want somebody who's with you to be. And that, for example, like when I did this, because I was having disastrous relationships, as we all know, and I didn't meet a good, the first time I did this, I wrote it down. And I'm married to the first guy I dated after I did this. It was a very long courtship, but I just didn't muck around with people. And I, I got it on the table very early. Look, I have kids. I'm looking to get married. I'm looking for somebody who's open to being a really good parent, step parent to my kids. I'm looking for somebody who has no entanglement with exes. I'm looking for somebody who has no drug or alcohol problem whatsoever. That's been a problem with everybody I'd been with before. And that was, those were just like the first five. I had like 200 things and some of them were more negotiable and, and I didn't go around trumpeting them, but I just knew, like, I knew what, how it was going to have to be. And if it wasn't, if I was going to ever have to be with somebody who was married or something, I was not going to have another relationship. I was will, I would be happier to be alone for the rest of my life than to have any sort of complex and painful, bad karma situation like that ever again. Ah, that was so great. It was, <laughs> it was funny when I made the decision, how powerful it was to completely change the, the cast of characters that even appeared in my life, completely changed. And, um, so I recommend it to you and don't even try to speculate and don't try to tell me that there's nobody out there. Cause that's just not true at all. I used to think when I was in high school, I thought literally everybody did hard drugs cause I did. And everybody I knew did. <laughs> And it turns out, no, everybody does not do hard drugs. So that's a, that's a, that's a impression that we get when we're in the middle of bad behavior is that everybody's doing it. It's probably something our minds want to comfort us with, but it's also a product of who we hang around with. So yeah, I hope that helps. All right. Um, let's see. Somebody said they're a member. I want to take that question. Where'd it go? I'm a member. Where'd it go? There it is. Okay. Mermaid says, hi, Anne. I'm a member. Read L. Bain's book, Limerence. Lucy Bain. Uh-huh. Affirmations don't work for me. Oh, I don't know. Nothing. None of that works for me. There's literally nothing out there that works. I think that <laughs> Bessel van der Kolk's book is really interesting, but it doesn't work for me. And Pete Walker's book is fantastic, but doesn't work for me. And, you know, the same things don't work for everybody. What works for me is what I teach. What I what works for me is what I teach. And I'm not saying it's the only thing that'll work for you. I think um, for me, I believe limerence has a huge spiritual component. There's like a hunger for divinity in that. And, the, you know, we talk about the bad side of limerence, but uh, there's a beautiful side of limerence. It's transcendent. It's sublime. And it, that is what limerence is. It's a quest for the sublime for people who have no access to the real thing. And there is sublimity to beautiful love that's reciprocal. That happens. Falling in love is exquisite. But when it becomes an obsession with somebody who doesn't want you and becomes an addictive way that you check out of your life, it's absolutely negative. It's a strictly negative thing. So all the stuff about affirmations, I don't know. I don't know about that. That none of Affirmations have never worked for me in any way at all. <laughs> I do Therapy hasn't worked for me. I, and, you know, it's okay. It's okay to try what you think might work. And if it doesn't work, keep going. Um, so, Mermaid, you heard my thing about limerence. I'm just like, you need meaning. You need, you need the sublime in your life. For anybody who, you know, unless you're like strictly against having a spiritual life, right now is the time to take your spiritual life way up higher, you know, four notches. 
there's a there's a need to do that right now, not just for us as traumatized people, but in the world. There's things are getting very crazy and all this like arguing with people about it, it's it's exhausted itself. There's nowhere to go on this. I just was having a conversation with people last night at a dinner. Uh, some people were griping about others and going, oh, they just suck so much. They suck so much. They suck so much. And I was like, hey, and I'm often the person who wants to gossip about th- people sucking, being awful, evil people. But I was just like, you know, when you start doing that, you become what you hate. And if you really want to have a better experience of life and perhaps make it a better place, you have to become clear and lucid and sane and wise yourself and try to call forth people out of the spell they're under that everything's so terrible. So spirituality. And um, if it weren't for my, my, I started my healing when I first got the daily practice, I started a bitter atheist about 12 years in. I, and then I then I became just absolutely devoted, such a powerful experience of God. Then I became an atheist again. Then I hit bottom even worse. And then I came back and just hoped there was a God to help me and started to really go on the basis of I will, I'm seeking an experience of truth and I, I know it when I feel it and I go with it. And that's where I've gone with it. So if you're trying to work things out by like telling yourself affirmations and it works for you, do that. For me, it is happy talk. It is not actually the thing that's wrong. For me, when I'm miserable like that, when I'm lost and alone, there's like deep, there's a deep spiritual wound in there. And it takes diligence every day of facing what my problem is. Uh, No more like trying to diagnose other people out there talking about my mom. Oh, everybody was so interested in my mom, you know, with her drinking and her behavior but who cares? The problem is, is that I was really having trouble connecting with people and being true to myself and being kind to others and getting to work on time, honestly, you know, I'm staying out of debt. I was having all kinds of like me problems and working on those was incredibly powerful and had a tendency to sort out the higher level problems, the problems that were sort of more felt out of my reach, like, like, um, depression, limerence, um, panic attacks, Uh, um, freaking out about the world, that sort of thing. I have a pretty good sense that no matter what happens in the world, like, oh, I'll figure out what to do. I'm pretty good at this. I know know how to deal with the intense emotions within myself. I know how to spring to action. I know how to, I have pretty good tools for sorting out um, what's the other person and what's me. So I have a lot more confidence that I can deal with life as it comes. So I, I, I hope you will find that too. So I'm just going to encourage everybody, if you're a little bit spiritual, go read the book or listen to the podcast or go to the, you know, the church or temple or mosque that you go to, that you love, that you've been afraid to go to because you're a little embarrassed that you haven't been lately. Just go, you know, be with, be with what the most powerful thing, be with your most powerful source and then do what you can to understand that we're all seeking the truth together. There's going to be some differences in how we understand that in terms of spirituality, faith, also healing trauma, politics, everything. People, We're all trying to understand. We're all living in the same soup, <laughs> but we're trying to understand things in our own way. And so it's possible to have a difference of opinion and support one another. And for me to tell you, you know, I really want you to find that go, go deep. So this is a long lecture about the limerence. The, the limerence books are, are decidedly a spiritual. So I will have one in a couple of years on my point of view. I think it's very spiritual. And, um, so they're dealing with it as strictly brain chemistry and you, and cognitive behavior therapy. You tell yourself something happy. I would love it if that worked for me, but I'm just too far gone a case. It didn't, it, that sort of thing doesn't work for me. Um, I will say, though, that if you have a way to get re-regulated from your neurological dysregulation, which is the core symptom of trauma, you know, you can't, like all the affirmations in the world are just like noise when you're dysregulated. So once you're dysregulated, some of the techniques like affirmations, for example, that call to you can become effective now that you're regulated. So the first order of business is self-regulation. If you're a member, you know all about that. We talk about that in everything. (laughs) Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Jano, what do you think about getting involved with someone who is newly in recovery from drugs and alcohol? Two and a half years. I have anxious attachment style and I'm nervous about it, but very interested. 
So I, I guess you're saying they have two and a half years clean and sober. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I think clean and sober people are amazing. And, um, probably half of the, my loved ones in my life are clean and sober people. And I love them for that. Um, but also I have twice had the experience of getting involved with clean and sober people who then relapsed and died. And that really messed up my life. And, uh, for long, a lot, <laughs> needless to say, it messed up their life. And I'm a person with CPTSD. And the fact of the matter is having a relationship with me means there's going to be a certain amount of drama, some fighting, a little bit of like fear and anxiety, the attachment style wounds and all that stuff. So, um, when I get letters from people, they're like, Oh, <laughs> you know, they're newly sober and I'm trying to help them. And I, I just, for somebody who's like in their first year, I'm just like, stay the F away. And when people, <laughs> this is, this is a kind of letter I get where people are like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm with this newly sober person and they're not treating me right. You know, it's all about them all the time, or they're not there for my needs. It's like, no, they're not. And, um, based on my experience, I cannot stress enough that that we need to put a little bubble of safety around people who are newly sober and protect them and keep them safe and help them feel loved and safe. They're doing something incredibly important and in life and death. And so going in with our needs and emotions, you know, when they're sort of going through that rockiness within, it's um, very dangerous for them. It's miserable for us, but it's very dangerous for them. It's life-threatening even. And so the best thing you can do for somebody who's newly clean and sober is um, um, help their life stay safe and drama free. And everybody, everybody with PTSD and certainly everybody with addiction or alcoholism, you know, we, we bring drama wherever we go. So two people with drama, you know, I've been there. It is, it's a miserable, crazy making thing. And there's, um, it's very hard to see your way through it. So um, on the other hand, I think people who are clean and sober, they have a depth to them that's that I love. I've just, I always, I'm not an alcoholic, but I spent a lot of time in AA meetings and the woman who showed me what I do is a sober alcoholic and uh, she still helps me. I still read to her my fears and resentments and, and her alcoholism is very similar to my PTSD. It's not the same thing, but it's very similar. And I, I relate to the, to alcoholics in a, in a certain way. And that's been, that's been kind of a minus in my life as well. The way that I feel at home with people who, who, um, have a love affair with alcohol and sometimes drugs, there was a lot of, um, heroin and meth use in my family of origin. So meth does not really, meth is sort of like canceling of any kind of interest for me, but people who are on heroin, I often can't detect they are. And I just go, I don't know. I just feel really relaxed and heard with these people or something. It's hard for me to explain how, how I've ended up twice with heroin addicts and not realized it until too late. Um, and they both died. They both died. And I really don't recommend that to anybody. And uh, I, I didn't know. And if I had gone more slowly, I would have detected it sooner and would have had better discernment about it. So that's, you know, I really whatever problems you might find in a relationship, you can often head them off by going very slowly. Don't have sex for a very long time. People will show you their red flags. And if you haven't had sex with them, it's easier to say, you know what, this red flag is really a deal breaker for me. And you can walk away and your attachment wound isn't completely in a devastated state. And your sense of personal dignity isn't all over the floor. You're just, you're like, you know, I'm discerning. This is not a good this, this thing that I'm seeing. And I can tell you, and I'm sure everybody on this call can, who's ever had a bad relationship. There was a time when you saw the red flag, but you ignored it. And we're going to teach ourselves to be so self-regulated that we see the red flags and we don't ignore it. We stop, we stop and take more time. That's what we do with red flags. It's really hard to do that when you're just, you know, when there's this frankly, desperation for love. Everybody needs to be loved. I need to be loved. You need to be loved. And sometimes we will go out there and try to, you know, manufacture a loving situation with a situation that is not actually that loving. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't wish that on anybody. And for that, we have to go slower. And if we're going to go slower, we have to have loving friendships with people around us. And the best thing, a, a good friend, and this includes partners, a good friend is somebody who understands. They, they kind of know what your trauma is like. They care about your best interest. They are willing to put a little effort in, but we don't 
in, in relationships, you mustn't parentify or try to make a partner into a therapist and be like, they, they don't owe it to us to fix us. If you've ever had long processing sessions with people you're in a relationship with where you talk for hours and it just, everybody's upset and it never goes anywhere. That means, <laughs> that means you're trying to get them to fix unprocessed stuff in your own mind. It's time to go by yourself and just write and release and meditate. That's how you can stop the endless processing loop. So the trouble with somebody who's recently sober is they have so much work to do. It's there. They have so many other priorities that are life and death besides, you know, trying to get through the evening when they're actually quite unhappy with you. You know, that stuff, they can take things even harder than, than people with CPTSD who don't have the extra layer of alcoholism or addiction. And so it's the loving thing to other people to be very gentle on them and not put them on a position where we would be trying to shake them into taking care of us or respecting us or listening. Listen to me. This is my boundary. Why are you, you know, all of that. That's like for a person in fresh recovery, that's emotional violence. So it's, uh, that's why I don't recommend it. Not because they're untouchable, but because they really need a bubble of protection from the craziness that all relationships bring. Okay. So let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Jamil says, how to deal with a part that's a bully within me, shaming me about things I didn't do and how I'm not good enough with those things. I don't know if I'm the right person to ask. I don't understand people who see themselves in parts. I just have me, you know, I'm a bit of a bully sometimes and, um, and I don't like that. And there's no part of me that attacks me. I just, it's just me. And when I feel ashamed, I call it resentment. I'm resentful at myself. So here's the thing about shame. Um, some shame just kind of flies around in the air and sticks to you when you have what I call earned shame. So there's, there's free floating shame and there's earned shame and earned shame is when I've done something wrong that I don't feel right about. I, re I highly recommend searching your heart and going, what is it that you actually feel that you've done wrong? And then clear it up, you know, get very clear about what you did and then apologize to the person, make rest restitution. If there was financial harm, set things right. Sometimes you can't set things right because the person's died or they're, they've moved on and they're married to somebody, but you set things right in your heart. You set things right with God and when you clear up the shame, your head comes up and then free floating shame just doesn't stick to you so much. There's so much less shame, but when you have some earned shame, it, it, it's like a magnet for, for stuff that people want to put on you. So occasionally you get people who will blame you for stuff that you didn't do. Um, and when you have, when you're shaming yourself for stuff that you recognize that you don't really need to be ashamed of, it's, re it's resentment. Resen I'm resentful at myself because I have fear. I'm ugly, fat, stupid, whatever it is, whatever the shame is, um, you know, fear I said too much, fear I did this. It needs to get on, it needs to be processed. It needs to be faced and processed. And processing doesn't just mean we ignore it. Once we process stuff, you'll probably find that a substantial portion of your troubling thoughts, including shame, will just sort of evaporate. And then, and then there'll be this residue, this, <laughs> I call it wheat and chaff. You know, the chaff blows away. The wheat kernels are there like, ah, here it is. This is the thing I'm ashamed of. And now you have a little clear path ahead of you on what do you need to do? What is it that you need to clear up? I feel like in healing, this is way underemphasized, but I learned this from the, the alcoholics in AA they immediately tackle the stuff they feel ashamed about where they know they've hurt other people. Cause for an alcoholic, it's not, it's not possible to stay sober when you're just sitting around feeling guilty and ashamed all the time. And not all of it is imaginary. A lot of it's real. I, when I used to go to therapy, they were always telling me it was all imaginary and I didn't recover a speck until I got some help dealing with the stuff that I've quite legitimately felt ashamed and guilty about and cleared it up. And, uh, you know, you can, a lot, a lot of progress can happen. Sometimes if you can clear up a couple of things, it helps you get more perspective on the next step, whatever that may be. You don't have to know the whole road ahead of you. You need to kind of just take one positive action. But a lot of healing is going to come from honestly facing yourself. What's happening with you now? How is it that you're self-sabotaging now? How is it that your behavior is hurting others now? And until that is dealt with, everything else is just talk. It's just talk. You know, if, if 
we had somebody, you know, we've, many of us, including myself, have been in these relationships I had to lie about. But then if this other part of me is out there talking about how my mother's such a terrible person, well, what, what can I do with that when I've just got something going on in my life? Priority is my life. So many people, if you haven't had a chance to talk to somebody about what happened, I think that's important, but I would not expect endless talking about what happened to really get you to healing. It might be a way to help you get a little validation that, yeah, it was bad. Yeah, that would affect people the way it's affecting you. That's normal. Like, that's a good thing to know, but that's not the end, you know, actually like saying, okay, I understand how I got this way, but now I'm an adult. And if I can't clear it up, like nobody's going to come and clear it up for me. I'm going to need to make some changes here. And I want to have clarity about the reality of that. Like, what is the reality of my condition here? What do I need to do? And where do I find the power inside to do that? And that is the nature of healing as I've experienced it. So that's what we do in my courses. Hey, Rob, would you throw up links to the sale right now? We have a Black Friday sale. I wanted to have this call today so that you would know about it if you're not on our mailing list to find out about it. Um, 30% off all the courses and membership, annual membership right now, today and tomorrow. Would love to have you come in um, and join us there. You get access to my four courses, Healing Childhood PTSD, Dating and Relationships, Connection Boot Camp for Healing Your Relationship to Society in General, and Dysregulation Boot Camp, which is a super important foundational one. The daily practice course is free. You don't have to be a member for that one, but of course it's included. And um, you also get to come to my monthly webinars. So I do a big 90 minute webinar that's special each month. The next one is going to be about becoming your true and real self, finding the gifts that you are here on earth to bring and very kind of holiday special <laughs> topic and something very near to my heart. I believe like we do, you know, a lot of people, when we start healing, we're just like, I just would like to not feel so viciously depressed and alone. And we do need that. We need to feel better and we need to have love and connection in our lives, but there's so much more. We need to heal so that we can become ourselves. All the traumatized people, our gifts are suppressed. We can't really bring it. And the world is really hungry and needs us very badly right now. So, you know, with haste, we work on our healing so that we can become our full and real selves and begin to contribute that love and service that is needed from us. And when that coincides a little bit with maybe how you make a living or the friends you meet, it's joy multiplied. It's really wonderful. For me, it's doing what I do now. It's been a long road to come here a long road. I teach everybody like all the shortcuts so that you can get to your, your real calling faster than I did. But I'm here now and it, it's a joy. I get to be here with you. I'm looking, there's 633 people on right now. Amazing. <laughs> and uh, it, what a pleasure it is to connect around the most important thing is, is like to heal from, from what happened, from the evil that touched us when we were small. When people hurt other people, you know, when people become abusive, there's almost always a history of trauma. And to one degree or another, people who are traumatized, you know, we face a fork in the road. It's not always neat and tidy, but basically we're either going to carry on and keep acting out the trauma or we're going to we're going to recover and turn it around and be in a unique position to be helpful and shine a light for other people who are traumatized. And there will never the trauma will never end. It's it's the condition of the world, but but every person who comes and heals from their trauma becomes another little light in the darkness to start guiding the way. More information, more love, more support, more clarity, less interest in getting involved in horrible political fights and wars, and more interest in trying to find the healing and trying to find the way forward, trying to see the humanity in everyone trying to see the humanity in our exes and our parents who abused us and not to necessarily let them continue to hurt us, but to rise up above this identity of being broken and uh, no good ever. Like it's not true. It's not true. They, it's just not true. Um, I know people are across the entire spectrum of belief here. So if you're not a, a, a God person, just please translate this into your own language but we are made in the image of God. Every single one of us, every single person is made in the image of God and is meant to be fully alive and fully healed. So you're here now. 
You're just in the right place for this. Carry on. Don't despair. Don't give up. Don't, don't poo poo everything. Be diligent. Don't wait for somebody else to come and save you. The person who's going to carry this is you. And I know it's hard. I've been in terrible places in my life before, really bad spots where I did not know what to do. If you think even maybe there is some kind of a divine power who cares about you, pray to it now. Ask for help. Say, I don't know who you are or what you are. I don't even believe in you, but I really need help right now. I really need help. And I, you know, just if there's somebody I should call or a book I should read, could you just throw it in my path? I don't even know what to do. And that's really where it began for me. I didn't know. I had no idea. Every, all the normal people solutions, it was clear to me it wasn't going anywhere for me. So um, I encourage you to do that and to do it in the way that is most meaningful to you. If you have pain, um, if you had religious abuse, if you people tried to control you, abuse you, molest you, and all of that, please take it to the daily practice. And the daily practice is a simple enough prayer, if you will. And it works also for people who are very clearly not oriented toward prayer and would like to work with their higher self to release. That's fine if you want to do that too. But you take those fears and resentments that that everything is ruined for you, that you can never make it. You take it to the paper and you release it and you rest your eyes in meditation. There's a little sign off I teach that I learned from the AA people. And it's like, please remove these fears and resentments. I ask only for knowledge of your will for us and the power to carry it out. Love Anna. That's how I end it. And those of you who have 12 step history will recognize uh, some, some step language there. I borrowed it because it's just excellent and it works. And, <laughs> and um, that was my experience that my, uh, my fears and resentments were lifted um, often just temporarily, but eventually more and more, more and more until my real self could start to shine through. And I do think that that is your destiny. That is, that is what is available to you if you can open up to it, if you can allow it to happen. And if the, um, pain of the past around your, your spirituality or, or your, your trust that anything or anybody would ever help you out there has been damaged as it was in me. And it still crops up sometimes. I can get very prickly when people try to help me. Um, but if that's there, it goes on the paper too. You know, I'm just, I'm resentful at the people who implied that, you know, I'm resentful at the people who said that I seemed depressed because I have fear they're judging me and fear. I don't want to look depressed and fear. I'm not depressed and fear people judge me and fear, you know, just whatever it is, it gets on paper so that I have less of that and I have more open heartedness. So, um, Here's my victory. In my family, with all the heroin and booze and violence and everything, holidays used to be terrible. And miraculously, I still looked forward to them every year. <laughs> As a kid, I loved Christmas. I loved Thanksgiving. But quite honestly, there was often terrible fights and dishes getting smashed and people running away from the whole thing, you know, with the car and the <laughs> Christmas presents. <laughs> Some of you have been there, right? So I had that experience. And then when I was a young adult, I had holidays where I had nowhere to go. And I would have to, I, I, had, I was trying to figure out how to like ask people I knew, hey, what are you doing for the holidays? And sort of hint, hint, you know, because I need somewhere to go. But I didn't want to say it. And I didn't want to burden them or pressure them. And um, I, I managed to always find somewhere to go. And sometimes it was like a 12-step marathon meeting. You know, I always found somewhere to go. And I was just thinking the other day. So now I have a family where it's very peaceful and it's been peaceful like many years in a row. And we, we eat the same food every year and we go take a walk at the same time every year. And, and then um, a whole bunch of us write and meditate together. Some do, some don't. We, we had like four or five of us writing and meditating together, my kids and uh, their stepmom and different people in our family were doing that, people who had joined us. And I was just sitting there, I almost cried. I was so grateful. Be for all of it, not just for the part where it's peaceful now and I have people to do my daily practice with, but all of it. And uh, to have experienced the loneliness and to understand what that's like and to have a sense of how important it is and how precious it is to have people to hang out with. Um, and also for the crazy drama that helps me understand people who are traumatized. I'm How else? I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but those of us who have experienced what it's like, we have a unique capacity to understand and help people who are going through it now or who are about to go through it. And if you have like a five-year-old nephew or niece or something, you know they're going through it. 
you know, you're going to be the lighthouse. <laughs> you're going to be the lighthouse. And in age appropriate ways, you can just let them know it gets better and you're there. You're there for them. So um, I really encourage you to step up into your role as a light and not just a broken person. You, the light, is just as real and even more real. And as you continue to release the trauma of the past, it will utterly define you. And all this other stuff is just memory and history. So with that, I'm going to one more time say, come be a member with us. Come hang out. This is kind of where I spend my time is with the members. And um, you, right now, today and tomorrow, we have the the Black Friday sale. It's 30% off membership or individual courses. There it is. Thank you, Rob, for throwing that at the links up there. And uh, and uh, please go out there and have some joy today. If you see somebody who's all by themselves, say hello. Give them a kind word. They really need it right now. Mwah. I love you guys. Bye. <laughs>